Some of us are wondering if we're going to make it till tomorrow. I have an eight-year-old in my house. Having an eight-year-old in your house the day before Christmas is like being in a room full of hummingbirds. And I made a little joke in the first service, and people didn't think it was as funny as I did, because I said, you know me to be calm and cool and collected, level-headed. I'm slow to speak. I'm measured in my pace. And to have all these hummingbirds flying around in the room really keys me up a bit. And so it's been a little anxiety producing along the way. Lunch today was not a pleasant, quiet preparation for worship. It was just live wires twitching in the room because I not only have an eight-year-old, I have a 13-year-old who's also a little bit keyed up. It is a very exciting night. We are blessed. There were people laying bets on whether we would have any little ones in the second service. I am delighted not only to have all these little ones, but also to hear them talking. It's the night of the birth of the Lord, and we are hearing young children joining their voices with angels and shepherds and wise men and us. That's exactly right. So you know in the Christmas story, you know who the children are, right? We need to have children in our lives, children, grandchildren, friends with children, friends with children that you can send back home. I can't wait to be a grandfather and say, this has been great. Be careful going home. (laughs) That's not really me, actually. It's more like me to lock the door and not let them go home. We need children at Christmas because children are the shepherds. Children are the shepherds at this time of year. The shepherds were scared to death, of course, at the beginning. They're out in the fields and suddenly this light shines and it's not just a light. It's the glory of God shining on this hillside. But then when they get this good news, they cannot stand it. They will not stay where they are. They are making a beeline for Bethlehem and they are looking for a baby. They are looking for a treasure. They are looking for a great gift, just like the children in our lives do. I just found out about one grandmother who has been stashing all of the kids' uh, presents until tonight. And so the kids may have looked all over the house. They were not there. They were at grandmother's house. Um, we have some presents out with no names on them on purpose because even the 13-year-old's pretty excited about tomorrow. And so we will not tell them whose presents they are, only that they are wrapped and they will be for one of the two kids. So there will be no shaking. There will be no jostling. There will be no trying to figure out what exactly is in this. The shepherds, in their exuberance, fall over one another trying to get to the gift, just like the children in our lives remind us. And they have been told of wonders by the angels. The most amazing thing ever to have happened, they get the news of first. And they cannot stand it, and they make their way with haste, in joy, rejoicing, stumbling, running, delighting, exuberantly looking for the gift If you are among those who fall in with the shepherds, if you do not need a young child ripping packages open or just twitching with excitement, you should have seen the worship service was fine. It was after the first service when people were in the narthex that really the walls began to shake. We had all these kids who just couldn't stand it any longer. That may be you. That may resonate with you. You may be among those who cannot wait to celebrate and rejoice in the great gift of Jesus Christ. Rejoicing in the gift of family and friends being together and eating and enjoying one another's company, but overall rejoicing in the wonder of this great gift. If that is you, then you belong with the shepherds. And to you is born this day in the city of David a wonderful counselor. The shepherds heard of wonders and they wanted to know more and they go running. To you is born this day a savior. So come to the manger. Not all of you are shepherds. Not all of you are very excited tonight. Not all of you are having as much fun as you would like to have. Some of you may be more like Mary and Joseph. Mary and Joseph did not go to Bethlehem to celebrate Christmas. They went there because they had to. And that meant they had to leave their home and travel a long way with a woman who was great with child, about to give birth. And when they get there, they are tired and they're burdened and they're frightened. And we don't know if they know anybody among their long lost relatives and extended family who were in Bethlehem. There is, of course, joy in the anticipation of this birth, but this is not a birth the way that they wanted it to happen. Mary and Joseph are not celebrating, rejoicing, at least at the beginning of the night. Then the child is born. And there is joy, right? There is joy. But if you're like me, there's a lot of fear as well. 
I looked forward very much to the birth of our first child, and I found it an absolutely terrifying experience, all told. Um, all the way through, finding myself absolutely helpless to help Wendy get this child into the world, though I am a modern dad, and I was there breathing with her, and I was holding her hands, and I was right in her face encouraging her, until she said, do you happen to have any mints with you? Because uh, it's been a long night, and you're breathing right in my face. That is not the way to make an insecure about to be father feel better. I did not feel better after that. There was a lot of fear. Then this child comes and it's exciting and it's terrifying because there is no instruction manual. I do not know what to do with this child. I do not know how to take care of it. My parents are a thousand miles away. Wendy's parents hundreds of miles away. A lot of fear. We ended up back in the hospital because Sophie had jaundice. That was even more terrifying. If you are tired, if you are not joyful... If you are afraid, you're in good company. Because Mary and Joseph, despite their joy, were tired and burdened and afraid. And to them that night, and to you this night, the Prince of Peace has come. Peace has come into a world that did not know it. Peace has come into a world that fights peace at every opportunity, at every uh, intersection, it seems. Peace has come, and it is real, and it is powerful, and it will one day rule the world. I've been reading a lot of Dietrich Bonhoeffer this season. He was a pastor and theologian in Germany uh, who was captured. Uh, He was complicit in a plot to assassinate Hitler, and he was arrested for it and executed right before the end of World War II. For a 39-year-old, he wrote an awful lot of amazing things. I'll read a few things that he had to say about Christmas tonight. And the first is this, this coming of God to us, this coming of the Prince of Peace to us in the midst of our burdens, in the midst of our fatigue, in the midst of our fear. He says, the infinite mercy of the almighty God comes to us, descends to us in the form of a child, his son. That this child is born for us, that this son is given to us, that this human child and son of God belongs to me and belongs to you. That I know him, have him, love him, and that you can too. That I am his and he is mine and you are his and he is yours. On this alone, my life now depends. The coming of a child and infant into this world, on this alone, my life now depends. A child has our life in his hands. The Prince of Peace has come, and in his hands is the best place to be. If you are tired and burdened and afraid and not very joyful tonight, to you is born this day the Prince of Peace, a Savior. So come to the manger. Now, some of you, even here tonight, I told you you've come to the right place. You are in the right place, even if it doesn't feel like it to you tonight. You may be like the crowd in Bethlehem. They are not celebrating Christmas. They don't even know that a baby's been born. Most of them, a couple of neighbors might have picked up on the noise next door. They do not know that something unbelievable, unprecedented, unexpected has happened. They just found themselves in Bethlehem. The crowd who was there, many of them came from out of town. Um, the old, I was listening to the, uh, the service of lessons and carols in Cambridge, England this afternoon, um, uh, afternoon for us, evening for them. Um, and I was listening to this wonderful passage about to you is born this day in the city of David. And Bethlehem was not a city. It was barely a town, maybe a village is a tiny little place. But when Mary and Joseph showed up, it was packed. There were people everywhere. Because of the census, everyone had come in. So people found themselves in that spot, going about their business. Some were indifferent to Bethlehem and to whatever goings-on might be happening. Some were indifferent. Some were humoring the rest of us. If you're approaching Christmas like the crowd, if you are not a shepherd, never wanted to be a shepherd, never felt like running and rejoicing and singing and telling everybody the good news, you might be like the crowd. And if you're here because you're going about your business, if you're here because this is the place you're supposed to be tonight, whether you're excited about it or not, if you happen to be one of the few bah humbug types, and there might be bah humbug types sitting next to you, so be kind to them. This is a painful time of year for bah humbug types. Because they're all of us shepherds around, right? And I'm just twitching like a live wire. Wait till we get to communion. I'm about three inches off the ground at communion. And you have to be very careful with me. On Christmas Eve, 
when we're worshiping and we're coming to the table, I could just stay here all night. And I'm not kidding, but I won't keep you here all night. If you're a bah humbug type, kind of indifferent to all this rejoicing and all this jumping around and all this overblown celebration, and why is everyone making such a big deal about this? Here's why. Because to you is born this day Almighty God. The names given to this son, this child that Isaiah says, he is the wonderful counselor, he is the mighty God. And God has shown up on this earth and changed Everything. This night, everything changes for all of history, for the history of the world, for the history of humankind, for the history of you and me and everyone. Everything changes when Almighty God shows up. The last line of this is what I most want you to pay attention to. But Mighty God, Almighty God shows up. He is King of Kings, ruler of all things, sovereign over all creation. And he comes, you would think, to a throne. But it's an unexpected throne. The throne of God in this world is not on a human throne, but it's in the human depths. God shows up in the human depths. His throne is in the manger. The Lord of the universe comes down and his first throne is a manger where animals have been feeding. And standing around this throne are not your usual suspects, not the usual flattering vassals, those trying to humor the king and tell him whatever he wants to hear and make sure he is amused at all time. No, around this throne are different people. And around this throne are dark, unknown, questionable figures. Shepherds are not well regarded in the ancient world. They are questionable figures. Around this throne are dark, unknown, questionable figures who cannot get their fill of the miracle. They cannot get enough of this miracle, and they want to live entirely by the mercy of God. Shepherds have come, people have come, those indifferent to Mary and Joseph and their plight have come, and they found that God showed up, and it changed everything, and they could not get enough of this great miracle, could not get enough of the mercy of and power of God can't get their fill. What a turnaround for those who were bah humbug before and suddenly are utterly transformed. If you're with the crowd, if you're kind of indifferent, not particularly jolly, uh, more of a bah humbug type to you is born this day. Almighty God, a savior. Come to the manger. Well, some of you are townspeople. This is where you would be on Christmas Eve. You show up to church on Christmas Eve. But there are things that are not joyful, not expectant, not anticipatory. Some of the townspeople were not celebrating and didn't have anything to celebrate. Among the townspeople are people who need the abiding presence of God, of a God who knows them and loves them and knows their emptiness and need. Not everybody was celebrating the night that Jesus was born. And not everybody in this room can celebrate tonight. We need the abiding presence of the one who knows you and loves you and knows your need and knows your emptiness and knows the comfort and peace that you are craving tonight and knows the absence that you're feeling. We need that God to show up for us too. And he does. He does. In the midst of our need, in the midst of our sadness, in the midst of our wanting to rejoice with the shepherds, even if they're a little over the top, in the midst of our wanting to be transformed like the bah humbug types who suddenly are singing the praises of God, we need somebody who is everlasting, who has known us since before the world began. Before the world was put in place, God knew you by name and knew what you would need this very night. And to you is born this day the everlasting Father, the Father of us all, which is a strange name to give a child. A son is given to us, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, quite a name to give a child. Why would we name a child Everlasting Father? Because in this child, the everlasting fatherly love of God is revealed to you and to me and to this world. This child wants nothing other than to bring to earth the love of the Father. The child wants nothing for himself, unlike every other human child, including ourselves, who came into this world wanting only what we want. We want to eat, we want to sleep, we want to be happy and comfortable. This child came 
because of you and because of me, not because of him. And what he wanted was to reveal the love of God to the world. He was born in time, and yet he brings eternity with him to earth. As the Son of God, He brings the love of the Eternal Father in heaven to you and to me. So Bonhoeffer writes, Go, seek, and find in the manger the Heavenly Father, who has also become your dear Father. In the midst of emptiness, in the midst of pain, in the midst of need, God has shown up this night as well. For to you is born this day, the everlasting Father, a Savior. So come, come to the manger. To you is given, to us is born. This is gift language. There is a gift here this night. And while we are anticipating gifts, and in my house there's a lot of anticipation about gifts, there is the greatest gift of all that has come to this earth that we have gathered to celebrate tonight. And with this gift, you need nothing, You lack nothing. There is nothing you require if you have this gift, this gift of God to you. No present, no card, no picture of family or loved ones, no perfectly a chosen present given to you can compare to the gift of gifts. It's the King of Kings come for you and for me to show up in the midst of our rejoicing, in the midst of our need, in the midst of our indifference. God shows up every single gift, every blessing that you have received pales in comparison to this gift. It is as nothing compared to this one gift. Every good or great thing that we have or have gotten in the past that we anticipate getting tomorrow in the coming days, that can all be put with the crumpled wrapping paper, with the tangled ribbons, with the boxes of packing peanuts. If you don't live far from family, you don't probably have a lot of packing peanuts on Christmas Day. I have lots. Have to keep the cat out of the packing peanuts have to separate the wrapping paper, what can be recycled and what can be saved. And then there's the whole box just of ribbons that are reused and reused. All those things will be thrown away. And in comparison, all those things, the best things we have are as nothing. This is your pearl. This is your treasure, your diamond, the great gift given to you and given to me. But here's the switch. Here's the turnaround. This is wonder of wonders. When this gift of God, the gift of Jesus Christ is received, when this gift is cradled and treasured, all those other gifts, all the material blessings we have, all the things that we have, all the relationships, all of the hope and peace and joy and love that we have, instead of fading away to be put out like trash, they light up like stars. Because they come from the same gift giver. The same one who sent his son is the one who wants to give you every good thing. They come from the hand of the one who gives every perfect gift. Comes from the hand of the Father in the lights. The one who delights in giving you good things. Most importantly, the gift of his son. But all the other blessings he pours out upon us. All the other gifts given to us. To us who have been given this great gift. To you. And to me is born this day in the city of David, a savior. Let us come to the manger. Will you join me in prayer? O oh Lord, our God, by your great grace, help us to rejoice. Help us to come to you in our need and our emptiness. Help us to come to you even with our indifference and find that this night all has changed because the greatest gift of all, the gift of God come down on earth, showing up in the midst of our circumstances has happened. The Prince of Peace has come to comfort us. Almighty God and Everlasting Father has come to stand beside us and wonders have been told to us.